Thank you for tuning into the OSI Beyond's CMMC 2.0 certification lifecycle webinar. We are very excited to dive into the cybersecurity maturity model certification. My name is Kate Dunn. I'm the marketing manager at OSI Beyond, and I'll be the host for this webinar. Please comment with any questions you may have as we will have monitors watching the comments section and we will pass your questions on to the speakers to address during the Q&A at the end of the webinar. We will try to get to as many, as many questions as we can, time permitting. We understand the path to CMMC compliance may seem long and difficult, but we are here to make it seem less daunting. We have four industry experts from OSI Beyond, Edwards Performance Solutions, and MX Construction, who will provide insights from various perspectives encompassing the entire CMMC 2.0 certification process. The webinar will be broken up into four sections with different perspectives. First, the CMMC overview with Payam Porkamami. Second, assessment preparation with Michael Supnil. Third, assessment process with Matt Ober. And last but not least, government contractors pr perspective with Tiffany Emizekio. I'm excited to kick off this webinar with our first speaker, Payam Porkamami. Payam serves as president and CEO of OSI Beyond, a leading provider of managed IT and cybersecurity services. OSI Beyond is an RPO with the Cyber AB and has assisted numerous DOD contractors with assessment preparation. Payam has extensive knowledge of the CMMC program and is a CMMC RP. Fantastic. Great. Thank you all for joining today. Um, I'd like to start by taking a few minutes and give a brief overview of the CMMC program to ensure that everyone has the same foundational understanding of what CMMC is going to consist of. Uh, so starting out, CMMC was developed to protect the U.S. defense industrial base from cyber threats, particularly against nation state actors. The DOD's position is that contractors are already expected to comply with the existing DFARS 7012 regulation, which aligns with NIST 800-171 controls. But we all know that is not exactly the case at the moment. So the DOD introduced CMMC as a verification component to ensure the protection of national security. The DOD recently released the new restructured CMMC 2.0 proposed final rule on December 26, 2023, which we're going to discuss in further detail today. All right, so who is subject to CMMC? All contractors who do business with the DOD are going to be subject to CMMC, with the exception of those who provide commercial off-the-shelf products, also known as COTS. So whether you're a prime or a sub, if you plan on bidding on future DOD contracts, you will need to be CMMC certified prior to the contract being awarded. The specific CMMC level of compliance will be designated by the DOD for each specific contract. And the specific CMMC level required will, will depend on the contract, if the contract involves assessing, processing, or storing FCI or CUI data. In terms of the timeline, um, currently we're on step seven of this uh, graphic that you see on, on the screen. Over the next year, the DOD will be finalizing the CMMC 2.0 proposed final rule. The estimated launch of CMMC 2.0 is Q1 of 2025, about a year from now, which we expect the rule to be included in new contracts. For the initial six months, there will only be uh, a requirement for self-assessment and attestations by contractors, uh, stating that you're compliant when bidding on the contract. By Q3 of 2025, about six months after the launch of CMMC 2.0, they will be adding the third-party assessment requirement for level two certifications. Roughly a year later, by Q3 of 2026, third-party assessments will be added for optional and extension periods. And finally, by Q3 of 2027, the full rollout of CMMC 2.0 will be included in all DOD solicitations and contracts. All right, so in terms of the CMMC 2.0 framework itself, there are now three streamlined levels. Starting at the bottom, working our way up, CMMC level one has 17 practices. It's intended for contractors who only hold federal contract information or FCI, 
and validates 17 requirements derived from FAR 52.204-21. For clarity, FCI is defined as information not intended for public release that is provided by or generated for the government under a contract to develop or deliver a product or service to the government. The key change to CMMC Level 1 is that it was moved to a self-assessment model with the release of CMMC 2.0, and this remains unchanged in the proposed final rule. At CMMC Level 2, there are 110 practices. It's intended for contractors who hold controlled unclassified information, or CUI, and validates the implementation of the 110 requirements contained in NIST SP 800-171, Revision 2. CUI is defined as government-created or owned information that requires safeguarding, is not classified information, and is information that is provided to contractors by the DOD to perform the contract. In CMMC 2.0, Level 2 directly aligns with the NIST 800-171, Revision 2 security requirements. In addition, in CMMC 2.0, a self-assessment option was added. However, it will likely only be viable for a small percentage of contractors. So most contractors will have to be third-party certified at level two or above. CMMC level three has 134 practices. It's intended for contractors who perform, uh, I'm sorry, who per the DOD support its most critical programs and technologies. Contractors who are already selected for a DIPCAC high assessment are possibly going to be level three candidates. And level three assessments will be conducted by DIPCAC directly and not by a C3PAO. CMMC level three includes all CMMC level two requirements, plus 24 additional requirements selected from the NIST SB 800-172. It's also important to note that DIPCAC's available bandwidth for assessments will constrain the number of contracts that may have level three requirements. So most contractors may not be required to be level three compliant. So with that, I uh, hope this gives you a good overview of the CMMC program. Uh, I wanna hand it back to Kate and the rest of my colleagues who will discuss uh, the assessment process in detail. Kate, back to you. Thank you so much, Payam, for the CMMC overview. Next, we have Michael Supnell. Michael is the Chief Information Security Officer at OSI Beyond. As CISO, he oversees the cybersecurity and compliance divisions of the company and possesses certifications including CISSP, CCP, and CISA. Michael has been instrumental in assisting DOD contractors with CMMC 2.0, Compliance Assessment Preparation. Introducing Michael. Thanks, Kate, and, and good morning, everybody. So on, on my first slide here, I'd just like to take a little bit of a deeper dive into the differences between NIST 800-171 and CMC2 Level 2. Uh, before we do that, though, just a couple of quick notes about Level 1. Level 1, the way they've, they've chosen to assess that and build out the objectives for it is, is effectively a subset of the 800-171 requirements at the moment. It is just a self-assessment, which is, is definitely a good thing for contractors, but it does still have assessment objectives associated with it. So do not underestimate it if you do want to have a legitimate comprehensive self-assessment against CMC level one, there is still going to be some, some effort and some burden involved for most contractors. Uh, taking a step back though and looking at 171 as, as a whole, per the DOD, they've determined that 800 is effectively the minimum set of requirements that need to be met by an organization to protect CUI. They can be supplemented by additional requirements. If we're thinking about CMC level three, those 800-172 controls, perhaps export control uh, considerations and, and other situations with certain specified types of CUI. But that baseline does stay in place and they do apply regardless of the size of the organization. They effectively follow the data, whether you have a thousand people or, or five. CMC is the verification mechanism, as we've discussed, that these requirements have been implemented. It's the, the outside mechanism to do that. CMC, curiously, in the, the rule draft that we're all looking at at the moment, is locked at NIST 800-171 Rev 2 requirements. Those are kind of hard-coded in the rule at the moment, and we'll come back to why that's interesting in, in a little bit. 
Looking at third-party certification, so as of right now with this 800-171 system that we're operating under, the only true external independent assessments of 800-171 are limited to the small number of DOD DIBCAC assessments that are conducted. That's a small group of teams, small number of contracts, relatively speaking. Under CMMC, nearly every single contractor holding CUI will be assessed by an outside private entity or RC through PAO. And we're also looking at mandatory certification requirements now. So practically speaking, all contractors at level two are going to require a third party assessment. There may be some contractors that hold just one or two contracts that are part of the 5% of contracts that the DOD thinks they're going to allow to self assess. But again, unless you hold just a few of them and you effectively get lucky, I think it's unlikely that many contractors are going to be able to leverage the self assessment option at level two. We're also looking at attestation for full compliance at level one and, and level two as well on an annual basis, whereas on the current system, you can disclose an imperfect a less than 110 SPRS score and, and still be fine. Um, we are going to be looking at an attestation at 100% moving forward. A few notes here just to talk about the relevant DFARS clauses. The first one there, 252-204-7012, I've seen that for a long time, requires contractors to implement NIST 800 to protect CUI. And we also have some other requirements in there around incident reporting, the mandate for FedRAMP clouds. That clause is very, very widely included in contracts. I think it's almost universal without really any consideration as to if the contractor actually holds CUI. It's, actually, it's also routinely flowed down to subcontractors as well with the same kind of lack of consideration there. This hasn't really been an issue so far because there is essentially no penalty to accepting that clause without implementing the requirements. Uh, you, can, you can take that clause, not implement them, and as long as you don't have CUI, you're, you're effectively fine. That's going to be a big change when CMC comes along. For 7019 and 7020 clauses, they were introduced a couple of years ago now to, to bring us the SPRS scoring system, which is a self-assessment methodology against NIST 800 -171. It's also what the, the, the DIBCAC teams follow when they're doing those third-party assessments for the DOD directly. It did require contractors to perform a self-assessment and require their con con subcontractors to do the same thing, upload those scores to the DOD to give them some kind of visibility into the supply chain while CMC is getting off the ground. The 7021 clause is the one that we expect to start seeing sometime next year, which will cover the CMC certification requirements themselves. Now, thinking back to 7012, it'll be interesting to see if the universal use of 7012 continues or will they get more selective about it? To me, it seems hard to imagine 7012 continuing to be used without an associated 7021 level two requirement. That, that wouldn't make a lot of sense. I think contractors obviously are not gonna be as accepting of widespread undiscriminating use of, of 7021 as they are with 7012 because 7021 means you actually have to go out and get an assessment. And people are understandably going to be reluctant to do that if they believe they don't hold any CUI. We also need to just think for a moment about possible issues if CMMC remains locked at 800-171 revision 2, as it is now, and DFAR 7012 moves on to 800-171 revision 3. That's that's waiting in the wings. It's, it's nearly there. Tracking both of those sets of requirements at the same time, which would be what is required under the current language would definitely be an additional burden on contractors and I, I, I really hope we don't see that. Uh, what would be preferable obviously is that we stick to Rev 2 of 800-171 through the first round of CMC assessments and just get that first cycle over and done with but, but time will tell there. Okay, some, some comments on the CMC accreditation body and the overall ecosystem. This was created by the DOD to solve a problem they had with assessment scalability. Uh, as Pai mentioned a little bit earlier, the, the DIB, sorry, is too big to assess by the DOD all by itself. There was no appetite to scale up those teams to kind of the size that would be needed to cover the entire DIB. So the solution here quite cleverly is to have the DIB fund its own assessments effectively. So the Cyber AB was spun up to do that. They're responsible for both the training and certification of assessors through the CACO, that's your CCAs and CCPs. And then the Cyber AB themselves are responsible for the con consultation side of things, uh, RPs, RPOs. The Cyber AB does maintain a marketplace on their site, which you can use to find C3POs, CCPs, CCAs, and RPs, and, and so on. I would definitely suggest using that for reference, you could use that to cross-check credentials, absolutely. But definitely perform your due diligence 
uh, outside of that on a vendor, especially a consultant that you're thinking about working with. There is kind of a wide range of expertise out there in the market. For consultants and CTRPOs as well, there are some other considerations. A big one that I think is very important is their familiarity with your industry and your company size. Uh, when we have, say, a software developer versus a manufacturer versus a professional services or construction firm, those are very different environments, different software. Uh, one may have industrial automation, one may have CI, CD type software development processes in place. You need someone who actually understands those technologies fairly well. Size is important because if you're a company of 10 people, your capabilities, your internal IT resources are going to be a completely different ballgame to a company that has 500, 1,000, 2,000 people. We also want to think about the overall solutions that you use, especially if you use something other than GCC High. GCC High is very popular with, with good reason, very complete set of capabilities there. But if you use an Ignite or a Prevail or a Google Workspace, you have a bunch of Macs, you want to start talking about those things with your C3PO and consultant of choice really early in the discussions just to see, are they familiar with that? Are they used to implementing and assessing the requirements on those platforms? So ask these questions up front when you're shopping, when you're talking to Matt or another C3PO, C3PO, just get, get some background information on, on their expertise and, and what they're comfortable assessing and, and working with. When we're thinking about the actual assessment preparation process itself. The first thing that I think is very important is, is scoping. So everyone involved needs to understand the scope of the environment from the very first day that you start to work towards this. Uh, keep coming back to it when you're talking about the environment, when you're talking about the requirements themselves and how are you going to implement them. Reference the scope, keep looking at the diagram. That's not just for IT people. When you think about the training that you're giving to all of your employees on the handling of CUI and where it is and where it shouldn't be, that is effectively scoping training. So approach it from that angle. Try to disseminate that information out as much as you can so people understand the boundaries of the system, particularly the FCI versus CUI boundaries. You're most likely going to have a wider FCI boundary than CUI and, and make sure everyone knows more or less where that is. Not necessarily from a purely technical perspective, but just the basics in terms of where that information should or should not be. For assessment objectives, so these are present in NIST HR 171, copied directly into the CMC assessment guide as well. Track them very, very kind of religiously and closely. Uh, and this language that is used in those objectives can be kind of unclear to IT folks, people from a purely technical background sometimes. Uh, make sure the requirement is understood. We've seen situations, unfortunately, where an IT team has spent time and money and the work has been done to support a requirement, but it was kind of, it wasn't quite on target as, as far as satisfying that, some rework and so, so on and so forth has to happen. Do track the requirements individually versus the scope. So hopefully your GRC software or whatever you're using to track your compliance does this for you. You wanna be tracking 3.1.1A versus B versus C. If you're tracking at a higher level than that, you're just looking at 3.1.1, it's very easy to overlook a single assessment objective. They're off, often related within a single practice, but not always. Sometimes you will have one that's a little bit from left field and it's very easy to overlook that if you're only looking at the high level language that's involved. And again, keep rereading them. When you're having conversations internally about how to implement a requirement, do we meet it, do we don't, have the text on the screen and just keep, keep going over it. The last point I have is really just about the resources required uh, and just being realistic with that. Your existing IT team doesn't have the time to do this. It's just, just the way it is. This is a significant new burden for most companies. Uh, you're gonna need extra full-time employees, consultants, perhaps a mixture of both to build this program. As part of this, if you're implementing HR 171 from a relatively immature sort of level of compliance, you are gonna have a brand new list of recurring activities that need to happen every week, every month, every quarter, every year, and so on. And someone is going to need time to keep up with those so you have credible evidence when the assessor walks in the door. We've seen some clients be very successful when they've had an in-house IT resource uh, that has the institutional knowledge, the technical knowledge about the organization. They've been transitioned into a full-time GRC compliant cyber role. Their IT resource has been backfilled by a new employee and they've actually been very effective in implementing their requirements. So if that's an option for you, I would, I would definitely encourage it. I do, however, need to ensure that there's some redundancy and some overlap in the knowledge. If you have one person within your organization, a full-time employee that has all of your CMC know-how in their head and they leave, you're going to be in trouble because this 
compliance program needs to be maintained over a period of time. So I would suggest either have multiple people in-house that have a good knowledge of what's going on that can go through your SSP and explain what it's all about, or have someone in-house have a vendor as well. Do not just rely on one internal person or one vendor. People leave, vendor contracts are not renewed for all kinds of reasons, and you need to make sure that program keeps going. Now, again, unfortunately, we've seen clients go through projects, migrations, work towards this, and then someone leaves and it all stops for a year or so, and a lot of what was done is, is effectively lost, and investment is lost at that point. So with that, I believe I'm handing it off to Matt for the assessment perspective. Thank you so much, Michael. That was excellent. Really appreciate all that insight. Our next uh, speaker is going to be going over a CMMC 2.0 assessment process. So introducing Matt Hopper, he is a cybersecurity solution area lead, senior consultant, and instructor at Edwards Performance Solution, a C3PA organization. Matt is also active in the cybersecurity community as a Forbes SMB advisory board member and a member of FBI's InfraGuard. Welcoming Matt. Thank you, Kate. It's good to be with you. So I am going to uh, kind of give an, an overview of what the process would look like for a, an OSC, an organization seeking certification. So the very first thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to identify what level you need to be at. As Payam mentioned before, if you're in possession of only FCI, that would put you at level one, which is self-attestation. And if you're in possession of CUI, that puts you at at least level two, where you would need a C3PAO, which is a CMMC, third-party assessment organization, come out and assess you. So you're going to want to identify what level you need to be at. Uh, that question always comes up, am I in possession of CUI? And I would always push back on a contract officer, figure out what the contract states, uh, and, and if you have any questions regarding that, certainly certainly reach out to your CEO, uh, uh, a CEO. So once you've identified the level, you're going to want to engage with, it, with a CMMC professional. Now, even at level one, which is self-attestation, I would still recommend that you engage with a CMMC uh, professional. You can go to the marketplace and, and find RPOs and RPs on, on there. Uh, but I would, I would recommend that you do that even at level one, because it's always nice to get another set of eyes on things. Uh, if you're at level two, certainly want to engage with a CMMC professional because there's a lot to, lot to do there uh, from, a, from a CMMC perspective. So once you've then have, have engaged with a CMMC professional, you're going to want to identify the scope. And Michael talked about scope. Now, my recommendation when it comes to scope is to narrow the scope as much as you can. Uh, some, some organizations use Enclaves, which is a, a cloud service, say in Microsoft, for instance, but you're going to want to narrow the scope as much as you can, because the larger the scope, the more costly it will likely be for you. You're assessing more, you're having to put controls on, on, on more systems, and the likelihood that you would pass diminishes a little bit. I'm, I'm not saying that you won't pass. What I'm saying is that the bigger the scope is, the, the, the more likely that you would have an unfavorable result. So I always like to narrow the scope as much as I can. Uh, and, an, and a CMMC professional will be able to help you with that. So you've identified the scope. Then what you want to do is you want to conduct a gap assessment or a gap analysis against the scope, the, the systems within the scope. So what you're doing is you're assessing all the practices that apply to that scope and, and doing a gap analysis to figure out where your shortfalls are. Now, those shortfalls that you come up with, the, the, the POAMs, uh, Plan of Action and Milestones, basically it's a to-do list. You're writing down all the things that you need to do as an organization to fix uh, things to make sure that you uh, can go into assessment with what you believe is a perfect score. Um, because here's the thing. Some organizations want to say, well, I'll go ahead and call the C3PAO um, to come in and assess me, but I have some some POAM items, some things I need to fix that are related to the 110 controls. And I never suggest doing that. Always go into the assessment thinking that you are perfect because the assessor will probably find something um, uh, that, that is wrong that, uh, that you might need to fix or that could stop the assessment entirely and result in a fail. And I'll talk a little bit about what that process looks like from an assessment perspective. So uh, once you've identified your level, you've engaged with a CMMC professional, 
you've, you've identified the scope, you've conducted a gap assessment, you've completed all the projects, then you're ready to perform an assessment. And if you're still, if you're doing a self-assessment, then you go ahead and assess yourself. Uh, hopefully the, the, the uh, information that you got from the CMMC professional that you engaged with will help you with that. But then if you're at level two or above, you would need to engage uh, someone else to come in and do the assessment. They will perform the assessment and uh, through, through, through the process, there's, there's really, there's, there's four phases of the process. The first phase, when you've engaged with a C3PAO, is you'll plan and prepare the assessment. That's a lot of planning that goes in. You'll identify a C3PAO that you might want to work with. You'll reach out to them. I believe they have five business days to respond to you. But what you're doing in the planning and preparation of an assessment is you're establishing the roles and the responsibilities. Who from the OSC is going to represent uh, the organization to the assessor? Now, if you're working with an MSP, you could have someone from the MSP help represent you. But I would always recommend that when you are going through the practices, make sure that someone from the OSC or the MSP that's representing you have real knowledge of how that practice is implemented. So you're going to want to talk to the, the subject matter experts. You're going to want to talk to uh, the people who administer the system, the, those people that have the ability to answer those questions. So you'll establish those roles and responsibilities in the planning and preparation of the assessment. Uh, you'll you'll uh, hand off probably some documentation, the, the SSP for sure. The lead assessor at the C3PAO is going to want to take a look at your SSP. Um, they're going to come up with schedules and timelines. And, and, and there's a lot that then goes into that planning and preparation stage. The second phase would be the actual conducting of the assessment. And the assessor is going to be looking at a couple of things. Um, we, we, we assess at what we call the objective level, and that's already been mentioned. But it's very important to know that because if you are uh, uh, if you're an OSC and you haven't engaged with a professional, uh, a CMMC professional, and you're trying to do it yourself, make sure you're doing it at the objective level. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, anybody on this call or listening to the webinar uh, has kids or, or, or knows someone who has kids or has been a kid yourself. If I ask a kid, is your room clean? Say the control statement says uh, the room has to be clean. And uh, how, how do I measure that? Because if you ask the child, is your room clean? The child's going to say, yes, it's clean. Well, how do you measure that? The bed is made, the clothes are put away, the toys are put away, the trash is picked up, okay? So if I'm assessing the, uh, the, the practice, the room has to be clean, I am looking to make determinations on those four things. Bed made, clothes picked up, toys put away, uh, trash thrown away. If the bed is made and the toys are put away and the trash is thrown away, but the clothes aren't put away, the room isn't clean. So you don't get partial credit for, uh, for the practice. It's either all or nothing. So if you miss even one objective, you fail that practice. And so that's very important. Now, if I'm an assessor and I'm assessing that, there's three methods I could use to make a determination of whether or not a practice is met. I can examine evidence, things like policies, procedures, records, that kind of stuff. I can interview someone which means I'm talking to someone about how something is implemented, or I could test. And when we talk about test, I as an assessor am not hands-on keys. I'm not running scanning tools. I'm not running the test. I'm observing you running the test, which is why it's really important to make sure that you have someone who's a subject matter expert or an administer, uh, administrator of the system present to do that. So an example of a test might be, you know, if your policy states that your uh, password locks out after five unsuccessful attempts, I may ask you, hey, type in your password five times just to see if it does actually uh, what it's supposed to. Now, I only have to use one of those, uh, interview, examine, or test, but I can use more if I want to because it goes to what we call adequacy and sufficiency, which is does it answer the question and does it provide enough evidence for me as an assessor to ensure that you're actually uh, meeting that particular practice. So an example of that might be, you showed me a screenshot of some setting 
I may want to see that setting live. So I've examined the screenshot that you have provided to me, but I've also said, hey, can you go ahead and show me that in the system? So then you would log in. I observe you lo uh, logging in and, and showing me the uh, that that particular setting live. So that's uh, that's what we're doing when we're when we're conducting the assessment. Now, when we score a practice, scoring a practice means met, not met, or not applicable. Not applicable, you probably are going to need, will need uh, someone from the DoD CIO to uh, writing. You can actually email them and say, "Hey, does this meet it? Uh, like, I, I have this particular configuration. I believe that this is not applicable." Is this not applicable? What you don't want to do is make sure or you want to make sure that you're not just saying it's not applicable because, for instance, you're not using wireless. Um, so, so a practice that talks about uh, wireless uh, connectivity and, and, and uh, uh, making sure that the that confidentiality of the connection is there. Instead of saying not applicable, what you would say is in policy, we do not uh, we do not have wireless as a matter of policy. And then I may scan for rogue wireless access points once a month. I would consider that met, even though you don't have wireless, you've addressed it and you've met it because you're doing things uh, from, a, from a technical perspective to, to ensure that you're, uh, that, that, that you're uh, meeting that practice. So we conduct the assessment. The next thing, phase three, would be reporting the recommended assessment results. So Hopefully you've gone through the assessment, you've met all 110 practices, you're perfect, you're good. We upload the score, uh, we upload the, the, the documentation, you get a, uh, a, a certification and you're good for three years. Now, should you not meet all the practices, uh, every one of the practices has a numerical value associated with it. Some of the more uh, the, the practices who that, that might have more of an impact to the security of the organization would be five points. Uh, the, the, the ones that maybe not have quite as uh, much of an impact would be three points. And then the ones that would have a lower impact would be one point. If I'm going through the assessment and I see that a three point or a five point scored practice uh, uh, is not met, it's an automatic failure. You, you do not get the opportunity to fix during the assessment or the 180 days in the closeout poems and assessment phase, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, you can only uh, get a conditional certification for one pointers and you have to be at least an 88 out of 110. So if I'm doing the assessment and I find that you have met, maybe not haven't met five pointers, that would take you down to 105. In the CAP, the CMMC assessment process, there's a section that talks about limited practice deficiency. And those, those practices are all one pointers, but those are the ones that are only allowed to be poemed and worked on for the 180 days. So phase four is the close out poems and assessment. Should you have not passed with 110 and you get to a, a place where you've missed eight, 10, 12, one pointers, as long as you're an 88, you can get 180 days to fix those poemed items related to those one point practices, and then have either the C3PAO that you were working with come back out and assess you, or just those practices, or you can have another C3PAO come out and assess you, uh, just those practices. You, when, when you get to the point of an, of a, an 88 out of 100, you can win a contract with a conditional certification but you have 180 days to fix those. And so we assume then that if you win that contract with that conditional certification, that you will work to, to uh, close out those poems in the 180 days. It's very, very important. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about is the, the, the considerations with external service providers. Now, I make a delineation between a managed service provider and a cloud service provider. Either way, the cloud service provider or the managed service provider is going to be involved in the assessment for the practices that they're meeting. So I can't stress enough, if you are working with a managed service provider, make sure that you know exactly what that managed service provider is providing you because we don't want a situation where you're going through the assessment 
and as an OSC, you're trying to answer a, a particular objective of a practice, and you point to the MSP and say, they're doing it, and the MSP looks at you and says, no, you're supposed to be doing that. So make sure that you have what we call a shared responsibility matrix, which clearly spells out what the MSP is providing you and what you are doing as an OSC. That's very, very important. We don't want anything slipping through the cracks because again, if you miss one objective, you fail that particular practice. Now, going forward, if you are at a level two and you have a CPPA oh, come out to your organization to assess you, that assessment is good for three years. But on the off years, you have to do a self-assessment. So say year one, you have your CPPA come out, they assess you. That assessment, that certification is good for three years. Year two, you do a self-assessment. Year three, you do a self-assessment. Then year four, which is three years removed from year one, you would have the C3PO come out and do an assessment again for a certification that's good for three years. Then year five, you do a self-assessment, year six. So you guys see the pattern here. If you have any questions, throw them in the chat and we'll have time at the end to, uh, to answer those. But that's all I have from a C3PO perspective. Back to you, Kate. Our next speaker is Tiffany Amesca. She is president and CEO of MX Construction. She will be sharing her personal experience as a government contractor navigating the CMMC 2.0 assessment process. We are very excited to have her here with us to share. Tiffany has over 30 plus years of experience in the construction and regulatory industry and serves in the capacity of a program manager. Tiffany is actively involved in the program management of all awarded task orders and projects for MX Construction. Welcome, Tiffany. We are looking forward to hearing your personal thoughts on CMMC. Thank you, Kate. Welcome in, everybody. So let's dive right in. You're a DOD contractor and in between running your business, reduced manpower, and ongoing COVID material delays, let's go ahead and throw a new regulation at you. So where does C where do you begin with CMMC compliance? First, you need to determine how much your business interacts with the Department of Defense. For example, if only 10 to 20% of your business is from DOD contracts, then you need to ask yourself if, it's, if the cost of compliance is going to be worth it. If your goal is to increase the amount of contracts or to maintain the amount of DOD contracts that you have, well, then just like prevailing wage, Davis-Bacon and OSHA, it's the cost of doing business with our government. For MX Construction, we are predominantly DOD, so the, the determination was fairly simple. It's mandatory. Bottom line is if you want to continue to do business with the DOD and qualify for contracts, you need to start implementing CMMC into your company structure. Um, with first quarter 2025 right around the corner, your time is quickly running out. So you're going to ask yourself, how do you start preparing for CMMC compliance? Um, I made a mistake assuming that just like all small businesses that I could handle just one more avenue within my business and I could tackle it myself. After spending countless hours at Blue Cyber Trainings, webinars, trying to review and ascertain the regulation and then attempting to ID and research my own electrical infrastructure, I realized I was completely over my head and I needed professional help. I needed to stay in my lane. Luckily, if you attend any industry-based conferences out there, there are RPOs everywhere. And the question then becomes is, how do you determine which RPO is right for you? Or how do you pick an RPO? For MX, our recommendation is check their ratings and their reviews. Also, are they familiar with your industry inside the DOD and um, inside DOD? Like I'm a construction contractor. I wanted someone who was going to be familiar with what I do. And lastly, but most importantly, is a RPO that understood I am a small business. I have a limited amount of resources. I have a little limited amount of infrastructure, and I wanted them to be able to help us based off our business size. So once you've 
selected your RPO, what then? You basically then need to designate the right resources within your community, your company to help you obtain the CMMC compliance. Um, this is was not going to be a one and done kind of system. So when we started assigning people within our organization, we chose two internal management positions and we have one external IT person. When should you get started? I've heard a lot of chatter out in the field in regards to, well, I'm a subcontractor, so I have more time than a prime. Speaking from a prime perspective and a subcontractor perspective, some of my larger primes that we do work for, they actually have already started um, requesting and asking questions in regards to CMMC compliance on their pre-qualification documents. As a prime contractor though, we do have two active military contracts that are requiring cybersecurity compliance. Specifically, it's the 800-171 DFAR 7012. We have not had anything pop up in regards to DFAR 7021, nor have we had a contracting officer ask us about our SPRS score. But what I feel has been a huge marketing benefit for MX is that when I am performing my capabilities briefings, one, I do have my SPRS score. Two, we're actively working to improve that score. And three, we have completed phase one of our migration. So when I'm in front of my client, that is something I'm sharing with them is not only are we able to perform our trades and our reputation's good, our CPAR's rating good, we are proactively ready for cybersecurity and CMMC. Um, in regards to individual businesses determining what their preparation timeframe should be, for a company of my size, from start to finish, just for phase one, it took a little over a year. That is including um, ID and research of our electrical infrastructure, our computers, the software that we use, um, what positions within our company access the CUI. So it does take quite a bit of time. And the time you think it's going to take, assume it's going to take longer. There's always a bottleneck. And unfortunately, it's usually within your own um, company most likely, where you think you know how everything is running, where everything is stored, who's accessing what, you'll be surprised um, to find out how much is actually within even a small organization. Lastly, we're, we're going to conclude with why you should do this. I think we've kind of already figured out the why, and we've figured out the when, because the when is now. I think the biggest question for especially small businesses is the who. Do you have the internal support to start obtaining your SPRS, to start complying with this regulation, to start making that migration? If you haven't, you really need to start looking at your internal manpower and your RPO support. Um, for us, becoming CMMC certified, we've worked just way too hard through decades building our company to have a regulation offset our ability to maintain getting DOD contracts. Um, and of course, we're all DOD contractors, so we all have the same responsibility to maintain and protect that natural, national security. We have access to data, um, CUI, that we need to handle very cautiously. And with that, if you have any questions, thank you for having me today, but go ahead and put them in the Q&A chat. And I know we're all here to answer your questions. So back to Kate. Thank you so much, Tiffany. That was really helpful. Um, so that concludes our formal part of our webinar. Now um, we will be doing our Q&A section from comments that have come in through the webinar portal. Um, our first question is from Michael from Jason Miller. Can you talk a bit about the pros and cons of creating a secure enclave for handling CUI data? And then a second uh, question was, can you give an example of when an enclave would make sense? I'm gonna shoot yeah. back over to you, Michael. Sure, I can, I can do that. So 
in, in any any company, any environment, we, we talked a little bit about the idea that there is an FCI boundary and a CUI boundary. So I tend to think in a certain sense, every company has an enclave. It's just how, how big is it relative to the rest of the environment? So if you do have just a small portion of your business uh, associated with the DOD, if you can perhaps keep CUI out of your email and you have a credible way to do that through your business processes, maybe have alternate file sharing mechanisms and things like that to communicate with your customers. If you can do those things, I think an enclave makes a, a ton of sense. You can potentially save a lot of money, minimize the scope, a less likelihood of any kind of cyber incident occurring from a practical perspective. There's a lot of good reasons to do it, but in, in my experience, email is usually the, the deciding factor. Can you can you do that? It's tough sometimes to, to do that. But um, I'd like to see if Matt has any input on that as well. On on the actual boundary? On just the, 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 the enclave versus whole enterprise approach for level two. Yeah, so the enclave is a whole lot easier. Um, uh, talking about, you know, uh, uh, some sort of an environment where all the CUI lives and you have a situation where you're connecting to it uh, using a laptop in a VDI environment where everything is stored, transmitter, processed in in the in, in that cloud environment, yeah, to me that's a whole lot easier than the four walls of an organization. But you know, CUI isn't just digital; it's paper too, physical. So if you're a manufacturing organization and you're you know doing molds or patterns of parts, that's physical CUI. Can't store that in the cloud, so you have to have some sort of a skiff or some some area where that exists that you you know disallow access to only those who need to be there and so secure it thank you so much for that answer my next question is for matt sarah donaldson would like to know once a contractor is ready for a formal assessment how long does it take for a c3po typically to begin the assessment and then do you anticipate a bottleneck once the rule goes live oh great question so um Depending on how well your documentation is laid out and how mature you are in that respect, uh, the, the, the planning and preparation phase could take anywhere from two weeks, uh, and that's before the actual assessment begins. So, I, you know, I, I, would, I would plan a couple of weeks. The, the C3PO and the lead assessor who's assigned to uh, your particular assessment, you know, will be able to give you better guidelines there because there's a whole lot of stuff going on. Uh, from a scheduling perspective, and, and you know, if, if you've got people that are on PTO, that delays even further. The actual assessment itself, depending on the size of the organization, three to five to seven business days, um, it's grueling. If you've ever been part of a, uh, an ISO assessment or a PCI audit or something, you know, use that as a guideline for sure. Um, uh, the other one was a bottleneck. Yes, because we're looking at probably, you know, 80,000 organizations that are going to need level two. And currently, I think there's 170 uh, certified CMMC assessors. So if you do the math, uh, the math ain't math in there. So we need a whole lot more assessors. Uh, and there's only 50 C3PAOs. So we're going to need more assessment organizations as well. So initially, yeah, there'll probably be a bottleneck. But hopefully, as time goes on, we'll get people in the ecosystem. Thank you so much, Matt. And I think we have time for one last question. And this one will be for Payam. Luke Baker wants to know, how do I know if my current MSP will be viable partner for CMMC compliance? Okay, that's a great question, uh, especially since with the proposed uh, final rule, we saw that uh, the, the clause for uh, external service providers, MSPs uh, being added. Um, so I think, you know, the, the first starting point for that is, you know, majority of the DIB being smaller businesses do use external service providers, i.e. MSPs, managed IT services, managed security and stuff like that. Um, so they're all going to be in this situation. Uh, the first uh, approach would be to talk to your MSP to find out what their approach has been and where they're at in the process. Uh, if they don't seem to be too much on top of it at this stage in the game, then more than likely this is not an area of focus for them in terms of serving clients in the uh, GovCon or defense industrial base. Uh, for example, for us, we, we got ahead of this probably about a year ago uh, before we even knew about the clause to ensure that internally we are 800-171 compliant and we're going to go for our level two as well to serve our 
uh, defense contractor clients. So if they haven't already made the progress uh, or started the process to, to, to making progress towards compliance and ultimately certification, uh, then that's a you know, flag for you to consider potentially uh, finding a new partner that is ahead of it. Uh, you want an MSP that will have uh, thorough subject matter ex expertise on CMMC uh, because your business will rely on them as well. Thank you so much, Payam. Thank you all for attending our webinar and especially thank you all to our wonderful industry expert panelists. This concludes our CMMC webinar. If you have any additional questions, please feel re to reach out to our team at OSI Beyond, or if you need anything from Edwards Performance Solutions, their business is also tagged in this webinar space. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day.